So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please take your seats. Um, and it's my privilege to welcome uh, Dr. Susan Knight from St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada, my fellow uh, colleague on the board of the International Federation uh, for Choral Music. And she was very kind to accept our invitation and talk about her experiences uh, of choral singing and choral festival and choral events as a community building power. So please, Susan. Okay, thanks. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm learning so much at this festival and um, it's just a joy to see all the perspectives of, of so many people. Um, I've entitled this presentation this morning, Growing the Voices. Um, it's about a very, it's a very long title. Well, my husband would say, well, she always talks too much, but a transformative model to revitalize, initiate, and enable ensemble community singing by multiple modes of access and connection. Um, I'm going to tell you that this Growing the Voices is a tale of two festivals. Um, in uh, 1997, um, well, in 94, actually, we began the preparations. I founded a festival in St. John's, Newfoundland called Festival 500, Sharing the Voices. And if you were at Kai Adam's presentation yesterday, you will have heard some really wonderful reports uh, from that festival over the last uh, nine iterations. But the festival, um, uh, as comprehensive as it was and as broad as it was, um, had a fabulous team and it, it grew and in a way it um, uh, suffered from the weight of its own success. And in the last two festivals, the funding became more difficult, bringing international choirs to St. John's became more difficult, and um, the board made a difficult decision in August of this year after the ninth festival to dissolve the festival. Um, and uh, in doing so, um, they did make a motion that they would cede it uh, back to the founder. I, I retired in 2010, and, uh, but they decided that if I wanted to take it and form a new board and uh, revitalize it and reshape it in, in a way that was a sustainable model in today's, uh, in today's economy and with all the challenges of today, then I could do that. And so I took that challenge. And, um, the new vision for the festival is um, it's a major operating shift from a major biennial mega event, huge production every two years, huge money involved, huge moving of forces um, uh, that is no longer sustainable. And we've even been told that by our major funders. They were, uh, when we went to see them after the festival um, was dissolved, they said there was a relief in many ways because they didn't know how they would be able to keep funding it in the form that it was. So we've gone to a leaner, <clears throat> more nimble, flexible, year-round operation. Uh, it's the new vision. It's going to be project and partner oriented with a major online and social media presence. We have new governance um, with a, looking at our vision and our mission again, a revised constitution, although fortunately we are uh, the same legal entity, so we still have our charitable status and our um, uh, taxes and so forth are simplified by that. Um, we have a new strategic plan and we are building now a sustainable business model. So this new board is very excited about what they are doing and very hopeful. We've retained the founding values of the first festival, um, and which are explore and celebrate singing together in community, in a non-competitive singing set, uh, setting, with an atmosphere of sharing, learning, and cultural respect, and a goal of personal, social, and cultural enrichment. It was um, just about the time when we were beginning <coughs> to put this new board together, the very beginning when Gabor sent the invitation to 
um, submit proposals to come to this conference. And my goodness, singing and belonging to everyone was at the heart of, of this new vision. And I thought that that was quite extraordinary. And I, I was delighted to have the opportunity to put in a proposal to, uh, to come here. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the importance of this word belong, and certainly with regard to the individual and the collective. Everybody, every one of us, everyone in the world comes into the world alone, and we leave the world alone. And between those two points, we are always trying to see how we join in the picture, how we can be in community, how we can belong. And that's terribly important. And sing singing offers a real way to be in community. We are born singers. You'll see later on I use the term pre-singers. But we're actually born singing. I'm a nurse, and I must have attended, I don't know, over 200 live births. And believe me, our first declaration of I am in this world is in the Queen of the Night range. And uh, so we are always, as human beings, needing to belong, looking for ways to belong. Singing is a complicated thing. You often hear of it as a very warm and fuzzy thing, but it is a complicated issue. It's both a cultural constituent, part of everybody's culture, but it's also an individual human capacity. It's not only integral to all human cultures, but is expressive of the individuals who comprise them and their relationships within those cultures. This underscores how basic to our human nature is the need to sing. It's as basic as our need to belong to our culture, which is the way we understand ourselves. And in modern life, certainly with urbanization, so many fewer people sing together than a hundred years ago. Let's look at the cultural nature of singing because it affects everything we're talking about. The nature of singing is cultural, though its character, characteristics vary, as do its expectations, its implications, its appropriateness, and its sanctions. And uh, Alan Lomax, one very, very famous uh, ethnomusicologist, said, overstep the, the bounds of proper vocalizing in a given cultural context you rouse feelings of shame, amusement, or anger among the hearers. So singing is an extremely exposed activity in human company. He also goes on to say the most important thing for a person to know is just how appropriate a bit of behavior or communications is and how to respond to it appropriately. Everyone in a culture responds with satisfaction to the apropos and with scandal and resentment to the unseemly. Here is a question. Are there limits to our cultural development when we look at who is involved in singing in the world today? Men are more, John Blacking, uh, Irish actually, but, but British, and also known as a British ethnomusicologist, Men are more remarkable and capable creatures than most societies ever allow them to be. This is not a fault of culture itself, but the fault of man who mistakes the means of culture for the end and so lives for culture and not beyond culture. So self-declared non-singers or pre-singers or people who are not singing and accept society's attribution of them as such are living for culture, but not so Diana. This is a, a person in a study that I had, uh, a reclaimed singer who is now living beyond culture. And she wrote some 15 years ago, actually, Thursday nights have to be the high point of the week. I love singing class. I never thought I'd say that. In fact, if anyone had told me last spring, I'd say that I'd seriously consider having them committed. And I don't know if you're not from uh, English-speaking culture, if you know what I mean by committed, it means you are sent to a mental institution. So, um, 
Here are some reclaimed singer narratives. Adults, uh, the first person at the top was 62. She said, in singing class, I can be overcome by emotion so easily. Just facing the years of hurt and the amazing belief that I can sing after all. And this woman was 62 at the time and she is still singing. She has joined choirs and many choirs and she is having a, a wonderful singing life. The younger, the, the person below is a younger woman. She was um, an anesthetist and she was um, 35 when she came. And she came because she had never sung anything to her children because she didn't want to contaminate them. And she used a surgical metaphor to describe her transformation from being what she called a non-singer to being a singer. Singing in public when you've always thought you couldn't must be more like undressing after you use some mutilating surgery, like a mastectomy or an amputation. You know you won't measure up. You'll be a disappointment to yourself and your audience. And worst of all, you fear you'll be the object of malicious humor. The miracle of singing class is the discovery that I am not disfigured, that my voice can be a source of pleasure, and amazingly, the limb can regrow. So I ask the question, is recreational singing less valued in Western culture in the last 50 years? Well, values in singing depends on what cultures they, in, they are in, as are the practices, but it is a culture's imperatives that shapes its impressions, and it can exist along a continuum from just maintenance to transformation. And John Blacking in 1973, he posed that industrialized, capitalized societies, value became attached to products rather than process. And as a result, music became commoditized, shifting away from the participatory process it had once been in many Western societies. And urbanization has certainly accomplished that. John Sloboda, in 15 years ago, supported Blacking's view, and he proposed at that time in the UK the prevailing discourse about musical performance had become talent, achievement and success rather than community fulfillment or transcendence, which is a pretty scathing critique. So I want to talk just a little bit about societal beliefs about singing. Um, folk psychology is a very powerful influence on the formation and perpetuation of our cultural assumptions in whatever culture you belong. And in Western folk psychology, singing is often perceived and expressed as a fixed innate capacity. You are, one is either born or not born a singer. And this perspective is expressed in colloquial language, tune deafness, dysmelodia, droners, grunters, growlers, monotones, poor pitch singers, anchi the Japanese say, which means um, tone idiot uncertain singers, backward singers, etc. So it's well launched in the culture, but in actual fact, we need far more surveys of singing, but the few that have been done indicate that upwards of 50, 60% of people will tell you if you ask them in the street, they can't sing. Now, there are many reasons they may be saying that, but so many people say they can't sing when in fact they could. So who isn't singing and why, and how do we engage them? And so these are some of the things we are trying to reach, we'll be trying to reach out and find out. So we are broadening the focus for sharing the voices too. We will continue to focus on the development and uh, support of choral music and choirs, um, but we are going to broaden it to embrace a, um, a wider ecology of expressive life and include encouragement and access uh, and connection for informal singing. There are three um, movements that have become very strong around the world and they're groundswell movements. They're affecting every facet of life. Uh, they're affecting government, they're affecting business, they're affecting university life, they're affecting 
artistic life. And these three are the notion of the expressive life. And this comes um, uh, from Bill Ivey, who uh, ran the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington um, in Bl Clinton's administration. And he also was the, uh, um, the uh, person who uh, led the um, arts transition for Obama when he first came to office. He's at Vanderbilt University and he has written extensively and there is a whole um, literature around the expressive life. Simply put, everybody has the right to an expressive life. And the movement about public engagement is also a groundswell movement and it's about people wanting meaning in their lives. They don't want to just consume life, they want to be um, engaged. And this again, this whole notion of public engagement, this movement has entered many institutions all over the world. The arts councils of the world, I, I have served on the board of the Canada Council when we adopted public engagement as a main uh, pillar. And Australia, Britain, um, governments, universities, public engagement, linking with community and having real meaning in lives rather than just being told or just buying somebody else's culture. And again, participatory culture. And um, I come from Newfoundland and Labrador and we are one of the last bastions in North America that has still a participatory culture uh, where people continue to make the culture daily and inter intergenerationally. There are places as, uh, in Nova Scotia, in Cape Breton, in parts of Quebec, and in Appalachia. And apart from that, the whole uh, reality of participatory culture is waning. The curious thing is if you Google participatory culture, what you will get is online culture. It is what they call participatory culture, but people belonging to, to communities online. So the operating principle for Festival 500 Sharing the Voices 2 is it's going to be a facilitating agency for all forms of singing together in community. It's going to be project-oriented, partnership approach, exploration of multiple singing platforms, the sphere of influence will remain local to global, and there will be ongoing research about singing. So the, we hope this will help encourage the whole person and the societies through singing together, and people will feel more engaged in participatory culture and be leading expressive lives. We hope we will be able to contribute to that and to motivate others to, to, to form similar kinds of things. Here are some singing development indicators. This is um, one you will see that I have highlighted, but first as an infant where well, we begin singing. Our whole life, our whole communication until we say our first word is sung. It is intoned, it's extremely um, uh, um, close bond with the mother and other members in the family, but that is how we communicate with the world and how the world and affection and, and uh, regard are, are communicated to us and it's how we form our identity. We are singers. We are born singers and then later on, about 16, 18 months, we start to be talkers. But we're initially singers. And it's really curious how we, how we move away from that depending on our culture. So you have to be exposed to singing, Wonderful if it's in the family. Um, you have to be encouraged about singing. I'm talking about little ones, but everybody living as well. You have to have access, and this is one of the things that's a real problem in the world because right now if you live in a city particularly, unless you sing in a choir or go to church, where are you going to sing with other people? There need to be more opportunities, and it's not the problem wouldn't be solved if you could conscript everybody to a choir and everybody to church. That's not a realistic thing in the busyness of people's lives. But people still would like to be able to sing. And so what access can they have to singing? And then you have to have experience in singing once you've had that access. And then on to instruction. And 
There are barriers to be overcome for people who would like to sing but haven't sung for a long time or feel that they can't. There are real um, social anxieties involved, the exposed nature of singing, public ju judgment and humiliation, uh, social skill comparison, you don't want to be heard if you're singing in a group next to somebody else. And, uh, uh, and, and then people actually develop risk management profiles. The first of which is, well, they'll avoid it altogether if they can, but how many of you have ever met somebody who um, says, oh, I can't sing, and they make fun of themselves? And they do that right off to uh, make you uh, have no expectations that they, they might be uh, able to be a good singer. So our initial model is that we are going to be a, fa a facilitating agency for fostering singing together. It will be lean and nimble structure with a low overhead and a very strong volunteer base. And uh, the festival um, over the last 20 years has developed a very strong volunteer base and we've been in touch with a lot of those people and they're very keen to continue and to grow that base. We want to be in touch with the rest of the world through a major online presence, uh, outreach and connection to learn, to share, to blog, to question, to, to invite to see how the rest of the world is doing things, to, sh to share what we are doing and to learn, to develop projects together with partners. And um, uh, we have had very uh, strong uh, encouragement from our own city, uh, which has always been a supporter of the festival. But uh, our first big sing-along launch is going to be held not only uh, with the uh, sponsorship of the city, but in City Hall, in the council chambers, after a council meeting. So um, they're on board in many ways, and throughout the summer there are partners in the park, singing in the park, singing on the harbor front, and processing along, singing as we move, uh, and then many programs for children, mothers and babies, the elderly, etc. so that we are beginning uh, we're beginning locally, and then on the web we will expand uh, uh, internationally. So we're very focused on teaching and learning and research. And we have a, um, a real intent to mentor uh, projects to independence so that so many choirs are so capable in where, where we live, well, everywhere, but um, to mentor them if they, if they want to uh, create <coughs> a workshop or if they want to uh, uh, create a mini festival over a weekend. We've seen examples of that already and, and uh, we know that that's a possibility and then that can happen also. Next week I'm in Cornerbrook, another city in our place, looking at just the same models uh, for them to look with partners. So we're encouraging each other. And this is a, you know the developmental model. I have a, a matryoshka here with all the, the little one, the, the baby, and, and then all the other sizes. But again, we begin by being enculturated. And there's a generative uh, musical development that we get to some extent. If you're in Hungary, you get it here. If you're in other places, maybe here. But there is a a generative musical skill development in, in schooling, and then you have the influence of your social groups, uh, and then uh, music uh, development and education <clears throat> in the wider community. And we are really looking at singing across the lifespan and engaging people and encouraging people across the lifespan. So here is a snapshot of this facilitating agency. Our, we began with our first formal meeting was with all the community conduct, co conductors of um, uh, community choirs in St. John's uh, to uh, invite their input in the building of this new uh, Festival 502. And um, they were very delighted to have their voices heard and involved. And, um, and they are going to be a major resource for themselves, for us. We will be working with them. We're focusing very much on education, uh, formal and informal, in, in every way that you can imagine. 
with research which we commission, which we invite, which we disseminate and we partner with. We have some interesting partnership discussions under, underway. Singing circles, sing-alongs, how to initiate projects like workplace singing. We have a lot of money being made by international companies um, on the oil off Newfoundland shores. And so we have a pilot that we're developing with um, uh, one of the oil companies to start a workplace uh, singing ensemble. Uh, and um, the idea is that we would start it there, but then it could expand and they could have it on the drill rigs. They could have singing times on the drill rigs and the drill rigs are, are of course all over the world because drill, the oil workers are on two weeks on and two weeks off. So they're there with no, you know, very confined setting. So um, uh, health and wellness, very important. Um, access platforms to singing, so you always wanted to sing. There is, um, I started a program like that at the university's outreach department, I'm going to say 25 years ago, and it was oversubscribed always. They had to have like three sessions running at once. The need so much for people to come back into singing was so strong. And um, the university closed that particular um, uh, um, facet of its operations, and we had it for uh, quite a while in, in, um, in Festival 500 as well. So that's something that we're going to uh, make available and, of course, train the people to teach it. There will be, um, that's another part of our, our whole education scheme. But parents and babies, um, all sorts of um, uh, opportunities, and the city is very excited ab about being um, a co-sponsor of these kinds of projects with us. So that's just a snapshot of uh, what we're doing. It's really interesting to see how national choral organizations are grabbing onto this. I, uh, I served on the board of Chorus America um, in, for nine years. I just rotated off. And always I was talking about Newfoundland, which Newfoundlanders tend to do, but uh, uh, talking about participatory culture and how much we need to engage and we have such an opportunity as choirs to help bring people into singing. And they did adopt just as I was leaving, I was delighted, um, uh, a policy of community engagement. And their most recent um, edit of, of their journal is all about that. Uh, you can see it online as well. But rethinking engagements, practices, successful community sings, prison choirs. And um, so it's, it's interesting to see that the choral movement itself is seeing itself as an agent for encouraging uh, people to be uh, singing together. And, um, and the other thing that's interesting, I just, I just brought it along. I don't know if this is, um, if this is uh, published in Hungarian, but it is a Canadian book uh, called No Culture, No Future, and it is about public engagement in the arts. And it's, uh, it has been an international bestseller. And just in the last week, this man who was the director of our National Theatre School has been appointed as the new CEO, the new Chief Executive Officer of the Canada Council. So very interesting um, uh, to see all, all the perspectives and I, I don't know if it's available well. We have more than just Hungarians in the audience but I know it, it has been uh, uh, published in all those ways. So our, fo our, our focus is going to be local first and then beyond. We are going to establish locally, and by that I mean provincially, while setting in motion the capacity for international connection, principally through website and social media. So you see up here I say it's our place. Well, there's three Newfoundlanders in the room here, but it's also your place. The little red bit, oh, I didn't mean to do that. The little red bit, that's Newfoundland and Labrador. We love our place so much we have a map that is called the Newfoundland Centered World. But we have a, a wonderful composer genius in Canada called Stephen Hatfield. You may have sung or heard some of his music. And he wrote a piece for us once and with his own text. And part of it was 
The middle of the world is not that far. The middle of the world is wherever you are. And there are some wonderful movements that are embracing all forms of singing expression, in fact, all forms of musical expression. And one of the first of these came about in the early 90s in Newcastle, um, northern England. And uh, it came about in many ways the same as the festival came about, because the motiva motivation for the Festival 500 was that we lost our right to fish codfish. And it nearly ruined our economy and culture. And the festival was a way to affirm our people and also to bring lots of people to our shores to enjoy and learn while they were there, but also to be an engine for the economy. In uh, Sage, which is across the Tyne River from Newcastle, um, they lost their coal manufacturing and they lost all their industry in the late 80s. And it happened to coincide with the time that um, money from the National Lottery in the UK went to the arts and they had a huge <clears throat> software company called Sage come together uh, to help them build, they have an actual building, but it was carrying on from the, the first response to all these people being laid out of work from the coal mines and from industry. We were luckier in a way in Newfoundland because we had people leave, fathers and mothers left and went to Alberta to work in the oil fields, but there was no Alberta for the New Newcastle people. So all this huge poverty and misery kept in this one bottleneck. And some extraordinary visionary people there worked with singing. They have a long folk singing tradition and um, did a lot of uh, work in singing in the rural areas around it, in the city itself. Now they, well, they have the, the Royal Northern Sinfonia there. They have um, every, every aspect of singing from recreational and uh, mothers and, and uh, pregnant mothers, and uh, not only singing, but having their um, prenatal uh, teachers there with them. The whole span of everything, it is just the, one of the most encouraging places in the world and is all about belonging in community through expressing yourself in song or in other some form of music or movement. And then Philippe, I think you're in the audience, are you here? There's Philippe Buisson and he has a wonderful idea and has been working for some time uh, establishing singing cities and eventually singing nations and this is another groundswell movement of public engagement and um, uh, he, his session is later, is it this afternoon, Philippe? Uh, yeah. Ah, just in this room, which would be well worth attending if you're interested in this sort of thing. So there are many moves in this direction. So here were our framing questions and the answers that we found thus far, because everything changes and you have to continually evaluate, uh, because Alpha has an omega, but then omega has to be an alpha again in order for it to keep growing. So we, what do we aim to develop an agency of public engagement to deepen and broaden the human experience of singing? For whom? For individuals through to communities locally and globally. Why do we do it? To create and increase open access to the joy and value of people singing together. And how should we be known a leading source of motivation, information, innovation, and services for ensemble singing. Please wish us luck. Uh, keep in touch, share your ideas, your questions, and more. We have so much to learn, and we promise that everything we learn, we will share. So you can reach us at information at festival500.com. Thank you. <laughs>